to our last keynote of the day today. We have plenty of more tomorrow, but you are about to be inspired by Phil Hart. And I can say that because I was inspired by this conversation we had uh, last month when we were in Australia together, and I asked him if he would uh, come and share with you today even though this is a little out of his comfort zone. So let me let you know a little about Phil Hart, um, who's been a really dear friend, along with his wife, Joe Hart, um, ever since the, my beginnings in, on Twitter, um, which was in 2009. So Phil Hart is a computer consultant and trainer who is interested in helping people learn today what they will find useful in their tomorrows. He is also a one-time teacher of horse riding, adult basic education, network design, um, coding, numeracy, physics, and project management software. His current projects include freeway electronic signage, um, a lot of other technical stuff, and also creating art with math. So Phil will now inspire you. You can connect with him on Twitter, at Phil Hart, and his blog is A Techies View. Thank you very much for that, Shelley. Uh, what a wonderful write-up. Thank you for that. And Also, I'm going to thank Judy and Jake, without whom you know, this simply couldn't have happened. And welcome to everybody who's joining into this session. So, silos and connectivism, the Finnish experiment. I thought it would be helpful if we had a map of Finland and see where it sits in the world with um, Sweden and Norway around it and Russia off to the east. Just to give you a bit of an overview of this session, we'll be starting with a historical perspective that dates back to at least 1928 and having a look at what's happening in Finland now and then a little bit of crystal ball gazing, having a look at the, challenge, the challenges that lie ahead of us. The current model of education goes back at least as far as 1928, by which time you know, all these things were well established. And it's built around the idea that specialist teachers teaching their own subjects to students. And the students themselves had to figure out what were the common features between all these different subjects. And if we take the, the classic trio of physics, chemistry, and maths, they're taught by three separate teachers, typically. But Chemistry and physics both involve things called energy equations, and they're both solved by using a technique out of mathematics. Half a tick, so you know, why are we expecting the students to join up all these dots? The same could also be said for geography and history. If we have a look at the uh, history of countries, their shape is typically defined by their geography. So if we have a look at, for example, Spain, France, and Italy, we've got the Pyrenees separating one of them, and so two of them, and we've got the Italian Alps separating the other, because armies quite simply couldn't find it all that easy to go over the tops of those mountains. So that's the silos. Steve Wheeler recently went to Skipton Girls School, and he observed something that struck him, which was that people were studying, or at least one girl in particular, was studying both physics and music. And he asked her why it was important to combine these two apparently disparate topics, and her answer is very interesting. Quote, it helped me to understand the world better, unquote. And that is basically the motive for this presentation. Before going too far down that route, I want to talk about the word connectivism because it's you know, the title of this, this presentation. That word was first used in an educational context by George Siemens in 2004 in his paper Connectivism, A Learning for a Digital Age. And that explores the impact of information technology on students' ability to access information. 
and he does so in the in the context of learning theories. I find it a very readable paper indeed. This particular presentation talks about connectivism that the Finns were doing long before George's paper. So what does it take to become a teacher in Finland? The short answer is it takes a lot. Of all the applicants that apply to be teachers, only 10% are accepted. It involves five years of study and you come out of it with a master's in education in education. And that's before you're allowed to go solo, in quotes, in a classroom. I'll be talking about that more, uh, in a moment a bit more. Uh, the master's degree in education is provided by the University of Helsinki and the course is, to quote um, somebody from there, fully subsidised. So when we're thinking about transferring the Finnish model of education uh, into other parts of the world, um, we've got to bear these factors in mind. Ooh, when I first saw this picture, my mind went, ah, it's complicated, it's complicated. But that just serves as a placeholder for what confusion you might be might remember from your own um, school days. Developing from that, you may have your own memories of teachers teaching as if they're in splendid isolation from each other. And I'm going to refer back to one of my own experiences. Admittedly, it's only anecdotal. And it was to do with my physics teacher and my chemistry teacher. And they seemed to be teaching somehow in parallel. I turned around and asked the, chemist, asked the physics teacher, you know, were they, in, in effect, tandem teaching? And his answer was no, which gave me a bit of a puzzle, which I've only just found the answer to. To my mind, we're, we've actually got two areas of failure in terms of supporting our students. The one is really fairly obvious, which is the failure to draw parallels between topics. We're leaving the whole task down to the student, and that you know, is a potential barrier for some students. The other area of failure is a little bit more subtle, and I'll be talking about this a bit more in future, in, in a future slide which is that students' subject expectations of what they'll be studying in university is based on their experiences at the high school. The first of these two, the, the silos, is fairly bit, being fairly actively debated these days. The second is a silo in time and level and perhaps is worthwhile exploring a little bit more. Going back to Skirt and Girls School, I just threw this slide together, thought, well, okay, let, what are the parallels between physics and music? There's no point in actually going through this particular slide, but it's sufficient to say that, yes, there are these parallels. Fairly obvious to somebody who's comfortable working in both disciplines. If we're going to ask our teachers to teach outside their traditional areas, we need to change both their expectations and their training and resistance to this can be expected and has been observed. Taking the maths, physics, chemistry trio, for example, not all teachers will be comfortable teach at, will be at ease teaching at year 12, year 12 level. Despite that, um, Helsinki's education manager, Marjo Heilanen, Heilanen, get it right, um, is pushing the idea of co-teaching, not quite the same as teaching, team teaching, but co-teaching. There are subtle differences there. Reactions from the educators, that's both um, principals and teachers, can be varied. Some feel threatened, others feel welcoming because it gives them an opportunity to develop their own uh, skills and practice. We have the argument that students' education should be brought up to year 10. We can make the same argument that teachers should be similarly broad because we could expect them to teach on one of a related group of subjects. We've also got problem solving. We're expecting more and more uh, students to work in problem solving scenarios and I think it's reasonable to expect teachers to do the same. Right, let's have a look at the time silo. We, we can leave the subject silo aside for a moment. I had a look at the year 12 science curriculum in Western Australia. And there was little or no hint of the mathematical demands from those curricula for university level. Now, if we look at the physics and chemistry, 
the, the maths that's needed in high school transfers fairly easily into the maths that's needed at university level. You, know, you, you can just use the same uh, algebra and calculus and get on with the business of studying the subject of physics, for example. On the other hand, Year 12 science, marine and maritime studies, is really limited to counting. This somewhat surprised me and is somewhat dumbed down um, from what people may have experienced in their own high school biology where at least statistics had been introduced. So you can imagine the, re the reaction of a student, an undergraduate, suddenly being confronted with statistics, imagining that they're all they were going to be doing was, was counting. And to my mind, statistics is a more sophisticated version of algebra, so we're, we're setting a very high um, bar for them. So when students, uh, potential undergraduates, are making courses, choices about which courses they're going to go on, they don't know, and their teachers may not even know. And looking at the enormous time pressure on teachers these days, you know, we must ask the question, well, is it reasonable to expect them um, to be a, in a position to advise these students. That's a problem for the future. All right, subject stasis and subject change. Maths is a topic that changes very, very slowly. Picture here of Plato and his platonic solids. Those have been around essentially for two and a half thousand years. The mathematics that was being taught in Scotland in the 1970s is almost identical to the mathematics that is being taught at Curtin University today. That's a span of 40 odd years. If we have a look at information technology, 50 years ago it simply wasn't around. It was a big grey blank. And it changes extremely rapidly. And what was being taught five years ago at year 12 may not be relevant at year 12 today. And this has a knock-on effect into other areas. For example, the performing arts. If we have a look at the film Star Wars, for example, a lot of the graphics effects were done by computers. So we must now regard PD as being the norm among teachers because the topics that they're working with change. Time to have a look at Finland. The emphasis, the ethos, if you like, of the Finnish education system is that it is the development of the whole person. It is not just limited to their intellectual skills or their athletic prowess. It also includes their physical health and their emotional and social well-being. And I quote here from Dr. Dr. Merger Paxinimi, lecturer at the University of Lapland, quote, Multiprofessional collaboration has been part of teacher education and teachers' compulsory in-service training." Unquote. So here we have a holistic approach. This is where I hark back to the solo that I mentioned a few slides ago. In fact, Finnish teachers very rarely teach in solo. There's usually another educator in the room. How's that for support? Breaking the subject silo. Finland has been doing this since the 1980s, formally, uh, sorry, informally among schools, and it's been formalized into the, quote, Finnish National Curriculum Framework, which is due to come into force in April 2016. So rather than being seen as experimental, it's now going to affect all teachers across Finland. And yes, there have been uh, some opposition from principals and teachers, but the groundwork has already been laid. People are already expected to do their own PD. The atmosphere is already there um, of holistic and teamwork. And the effect of the national curriculum framework will become apparent when today's learners leave school in a year or three's time. Time to drill, drill down and look a little deeper into the observed practice. And here I'm going to uh, cite the work of Anna Ritivara. Her doctoral thesis was on collaborative teaching. And coupled with other sources that I've dug into, it's now possible to give an impression of what it's like to be a teacher. At the top of the list is the word trust. It pervades the whole organization. There is also recognition of teachers in a social sense. They're highly valued by society. And they're regarded as fully qualified professionals. 
They are given total autonomy over what and how they teach. They see teamwork as part of their professional and personal support network. So there you go, teamwork, personal support. Harks back to the previous speaker's comment on resilience. You've got that personal support element there. Teachers recognize their own strengths and weaknesses and reciprocate with others. Lessons are jointly planned. Feedback from peers and students is sought and acted upon. PD is seen as integral to the... They see their purpose as teaching the whole child. Um, also, they, all classes are unitary. They have all skill levels. There are any special education leads in the same class as what we might call the intellectual high flyers. And equally importantly, the government, the Finnish government, values input from the teachers' union. They see the teachers' union as a valuable social asset. The challenges ahead. The major one that I'd pick up is a cultural one. Gillian Stewart from... Belfast, she, and I quote her here, trainee teachers in Finland are clearly acclimatized to being observed by a wide audience and receiving feedback not only from the supervising teacher but also from fellow students who are encouraged to engage in peer evaluation of each other's work. Pupil feedback is also sought, unquote. This is something of a contrast to what I've seen in England and Australia. Trust. I trust my students, I trust myself, and I trust my observer. I've been very lucky to have been in that situation. It's actually wonderfully supportive. I appreciate that being observed can make some teachers feel very uncomfortable. There's a barrier there to be overcome. The teachers of the 19, early 1900s view that they are the source of all knowledge is now, being de is now defunct. We now have the, the advent of the information age, and teachers can now educate themselves very easily about related subjects, related disciplines. They're no longer relying on what they had to learn when they were undergraduates themselves. They can now ask their students to do the same. It took the Finns a lot of time and effort to build their current model. It is reasonable to expect it to take the same time and effort in other countries. The time to start making those changes is now. Thank you for joining me. Well, thank you so much. That was really incredible and informative. I learned so much. I didn't know that about all the finished stuff. Uh, you know, you hear about such a great system, but you never um, realize you, until someone uh, goes through it all the amount of work and, and, and things that go into it. Um, I think Judy's going to read some of the comments and stuff right now. Thank you, Judy. <laughs> awesome. um, let's see, Annabelle was just saying just now, now she understands the education policy in Finland. And we, speak, speak, we actually have all been hearing about it a lot. Um, let's see. Uh, Jake was kind enough to give us your document. <laughs> um, <laughs> Annabelle, Annabelle says, no teacher in Portugal will teach math and music. Here each teacher master in one subject, or if they are in language, or two if they're languages. Um, Lisa said, we hear so much about the connectiveness between music and math. Um, I wrote, with the vast advancement of the sciences and technology, if a teacher is not willing to continue as PD, they will quickly fall into the dark ages, and we need to meet our students where they are now. Yes. Another teacher in the classroom can be of great help with Annabelle. And you're right, uh, with all of the technology online these days, sometimes our students are coming in more informed than we are. <laughs> And you have to think yeah. about those things, you know. Uh, but yes, if math and music is definitely a connection, um, and it actually have proven that. Uh, so really, the teacher should not be so isolated all the time. Yeah, I, th I think this this sense of isolation um, 
It is a historical hangover, and for my money, the sooner we discard it, the better everybody will be. Um, and I'm thinking not here just of the individuals, but as you know, society as a whole, the, the more that teachers and educators in general can do to improve the lot of, of members of society, I see that as the discharging of, of a social responsibility. I'll shut up there. <laughs> That's quite true. Quite true. <laughs> I, I, I have to tell you, I, my, I have a son who's an aerospace engineer, and he said to me the other day, if you, mom, if we don't understand what's going on in the world, we could never be very good engineers. So it's stupid to just think about engineering. Yeah, the holistic view again. Uh, Annabelle says she has Danish friends who, for instance, teach geography, religion, Danish, English. They may teach everything. Wow. <laughs> uh, Peggy wonders if the U.S. could ever achieve the changes that advance in Finland. There's so little support and respect for teachers in the U.S., and they aren't trusted and valued like they are in Finnish, like the Finnish teachers are. Which is true, actually. Where you, I, I was very surprised that you said um, they very, they, they honor the teachers' union when, in the United States, it's almost like abhorred. Um, it, it's villainized in the worst way, which is really wrong. Um, yeah, and I think that underscores one of the cultural differences. Yeah. Many teachers in Alberta collaborate and support one another with their knowledge of various subjects and ideas for lessons, says Donna McTavish. <laughs> no yeah, so it's actually been... Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, that, that seems to provoke some comments. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Jake. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you, Phil. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you.